Hello again everyone, my name is Paul, and you may have noticed that I have a guest with me on today's show. So we're going to be doing another Myers-Briggs video where I'll be talking about my type, the ISTJ, but my best friend here, Andy, he's INTJ. And so we're going to talk about the similarities between us, the differences between us, and also like how we interact as best friends, and also some of the areas where we clash. So, Andy, I'm going to put you on the spot here, very un like and see if you have any observations you'd like to share with the audience before we get started. Okay, well, one thing I'd like to say first is um, there was an article I read about how ISTJ and INTJ interact, and when the second letter is the same, I mean, is different, but all the rest of the letters are the same, um the two have a relationship referred to as neighbor. In a neighbor relationship, they, um, the two people will arrive at the same conclusion by taking different methods. So Paul's method is the sensing. So his method would be to use a tried and true method, um, that he knows works. Truer words have never been spoken, my friends. When when I play a, a game, I'll usually follow the same pattern as I'm playing it, to the fact where Ocarina of Time, I could practically have a narration of, like, I'm going to go to Lon Lon Ranch after getting Zelda's letter, and I'm going to learn Epona's song, then I'm going to get the bottle from Talon, and then I'm going to go to the Lost Woods, and I know the route by heart, and then I'm going to get Saria's song, then after that I go to Cake Rico Village, then I go to the graveyard... I mean, that's what goes on in my head. I'm obviously not going to talk that fast. Whereas him, on the other hand, he's going to want to try every new possibility. Like when you were playing Fire Emblem. Oh, yeah. There was like a, a map that I had to go through. And and I was looking at... There was this one character that um that I wanted to have a dialogue with that you have to fight. But he's a really tough enemy. So I needed to... um time it right so that I would have full guard points so that I could, like, attack him and then deflect the blow. But at the same time, there were archers that were approaching in, and so I was like, well, um, I need to fend them off so I can stay in the battle, and, and I wanted to get experience, so I have to stay there. And I also wanted to get all the chest, and um, I could have run away if I wanted to. And I kept telling him, like, Andy, you've only got three turns left, there's the escape right there, you might as well get out of here while you have a chance. But he said... I can always reset. And sure enough, he went and he positioned his units, hoping that he could get more experience. He went over and he wanted to get the chest, and he got clobbered. And I said, Andrew, it's your own stinking fault for sending your units into the fray. And he's like, well, I'm, I'm still going to reset. And he hates it when I imitate his voice, so that'll actually get a rare chuckle out of him. But yeah, with the um, the neighbor um, function... Um, yeah, we would use the different methods for the same, um, different, the same thing, to arrive at the same conclusion, so, um... Like a Sudoku like, puzzle, for instance. Yeah, like a, for a Sudoku puzzle, um, Paul would stick to the methods that he's always used the whole time, and he would get the answer, and then with me, I would try thinking of different possible ways to solve it, but I would get the same solution as him. I mean, we'd both solve it either way, but he would just, like, experiment saying, maybe I can solve the puzzle like this, whereas with me, when I solve Sudoku, I always have a method that I follow for doing Sudoku, and I don't really deviate from that method because it's worked before, so it'll work again, right? And he's just like, no, that's that's too much for me. Or, no, I gotta do it in his voice that he hates. No, that, that's too much for me, Paul. I, I can't do that. Which he, he says that sounds nothing like him, so mm. you be the judge of that. Now, where we're similar is that we actually share the two uh, middle functions. That would be the secondary and tertiary functions. So we both share secondary extroverted thinking and secondary introverted feeling. And so I'll take care of the introverted feeling. Andy, why don't you talk about where mutual secondary extroverted feeling comes into play? Or extroverted thinking, sorry. Yeah, so I mean, with the um, extroverted thinking, um, it's it's all about uh, 
it's how you think out loud. So having this explanation is a perfect example because it's how you um you're talking and that's how you're explaining it versus in if it were an introverted thinking it would just all be in your head you're just like explaining to yourself how it works in your head but it's not like coming out yeah so we're basically expressing our thoughts and our logic to you guys out loud in an extroverted format because you're obviously you're seeing us talk you're seeing us think to you out loud we're not just keeping this all in our heads but what we do keep in our heads is introverted feeling and for me i would say that that manifests itself in the fact that i pay way more attention to what i'm feeling on the inside than what's going on around me like i know those crazy infjs boy can andy tell you some stories about them like infjs they like can sort of feel your negative energy when you're sad and like they can tell when you're happy me i'm i guess i kind of have to guess at that or like try really hard but inside my head i'm like a storm of drama but people usually don't know it for instance i could be with friends and i could be like actually i was today i was with some friends at baskin robbins and i was having a pretty miserable day and as i was sitting at the table i wasn't crying i wasn't like pounding my fists or anything i just when they said something that sort of got me going i just went and that was it or i would like just narrow my eyebrows like that and that would be it um as for him this face that you see right here that's his like everyday face when he's happy he looks like that when he's sad he looks like that when he's angry he looks like that and you want to tell them what's actually happening yeah well i mean um i've gotten it like one day i was just taking a, a walk and someone from a car opened their window and they yelled at me it's gonna be okay everything's gonna be okay and then and i'm like there's nothing wrong <laughs> yeah sometimes people say like what's the matter paul and i'll be like nothing i'm just thinking <laughs> what the heck yeah, oftentimes they claim that we wear our hearts on our sleeves, but really we don't. We just have a neutral, sort of stoic look, shall we say. But now it's time to talk about where we're very different, and that's in our inferior functions, which is, for me, that would be inferior extroverted intuition. For him, that would be inferior extroverted sensing. So I've always said that extroverted sensing is by far the most annoying over-the-top function that I wish never existed. So what's it like having that in your function stack? Or rather, how are you weak in it? Well, I mean, an inferior function isn't necessarily a bad thing, and, and especially what they say is you should develop it so it gets better. But um, extroverted sensing for an INTJ is kind of like, it's um, we we interact with our environment, we can see things, but... Um, since it's an inferior function, it will easily be overridden by the um, inter in introverted intuition. So, so if if I'm thinking about something really hard, or if someone's talking to me, then I won't always see what's happening in front of me. And like, I got a speeding ticket because I had a friend in the car and he was talking to me because I couldn't pay attention to him and the row at the same time. And he didn't notice that I was doing crazy symbols because I was like, what the heck? How, how does this even make sense? As for myself, having inferior extroverted intuition, I'd like to say I've developed it good enough because Andy usually says like, wow, Paul, that's a pretty creative solution you have there. But Oftentimes, when new ideas are presented to me, I'm usually, like, stupid reluctant to try them out. And I'm going to let him take over from here, because he loves oh. making fun of me for this. Well, there's there's lots of times where there's, like, some really, like, really cool things that I've gotten into. Like, like for example, Dante, or, or like, with Harry Potter, like... Um, oh, I used to think that Harry Potter was so evil that the Bible was against it, and there was no way the church would allow that, and Andy was like... Well, I just, I didn't know that Paul even thought that, but I just, um, I just thought he just wasn't, like, into it or something like that, and, and I, and I just, just thought it was, like, really cool, because it's, like, a cool, like, universe and everything like that, and, um, um, you see, one thing about INTJs is that INTJs love, um, 
weird new twists. Like if it if it's something that it's like um seen at a strange angle that you never thought of before, then then that's just like so cool because it's like a different it's like a different possibility that um like two things that are put together that you wouldn't think would be together. Huh. So basically he would be like ecstatic when Ocarina of Time com- came out and you could finally see Link's back instead of just looking at him from like above like you could in the rest of his games. Sorry, that's my literal mind cuz Well, that wasn't exactly what I meant, but uh, Let's see what you uh, Introverted sensing is my dominant function it means I take everything at total face value. So when he said see things at a new angle, I was thinking like you mean angle is in like like you know how my hand is at a different angle. And he's like, "No, that's not what I mean." Or I'll let him say it. Well, I mean what I what I mean really is that like you see something from a different perspective or maybe you you see two things together that you don't normally see together like for example in my book that i'm writing on um, air ducts are a form of transportation so you never think of like you think of like transportation and you think of air ducts separately but to them to being together as one concept oh i see that's a new angle that's like oh huh. that's a good way of looking at it i'll have to let my INFJ friend know about that and see if that's like her method of thinking but as far as inferior extroverted intuition it's also that function where Dolores Umbridge does a great job of um, illustrating this in Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix where she says progress for progress's sake must be prohibited where she she's against the idea of progress because she always wants to do what's tried and true and what authority tells her to do so if the minister says this is the way you have to teach defense against the dark arts naturally she's going to do it and she's going to say well sorry but all these new methods of teaching defense have proven to be flimsy and not worked and i'm often like that myself like for instance when dvds first came out i said Oh, this is so stupid. These are never going to replace VHSs because VHSs, you can like forward and rewind to a very specific point of the tape rather than choosing by scenes in a DVD because that's just the epitome of stupid and DVDs are so flimsy. They're going to break easily. I was like, they should just stick to VCRs. Same thing with when the Nintendo GameCube came out. I said, why couldn't they just keep making Nintendo 64 games? I mean, Super Mario 64 was fantastic. Ocarina of Time was fantastic. Why did Wind Waker have to come along and have such a horrible, screwy art style that's just so sickeningly cute? He, on the other hand, was like... What were you talking about? The GameCube, how it came out and it was something new to replace the Nintendo 64. Oh, well, I mean... I just saw it as another game system. I mean, like, it's good. I mean, I, I've i always gotten, like, the game system, like, very late. Same here, actually. But, um, but I don't really look at, like, all the fine details of it, um, is like that. I mean, I just, like, I like games for the content rather than, like, the graphics. Like, a lot of people are saying, like, the like, oldest oh, game such has great graphics. And I'm like, so... I'm I'm here in for the storyline. I, I could care less about the graphics. I mean, it's great that they had good graphics, but um, it doesn't really matter much to me. So you're telling me that after you've played Majora's Mask 3D, like you can effortlessly go back to the the, the Nintendo 64 version that looks like a child's crayon drawing in comparison? Um, yeah. I mean, it doesn't really matter that much. I mean, the game is great either way, but you have to admit, with a fresh color of paint and with higher resolution, it definitely adds a lot to smoothing out the game and making it look like passable i mean i'm all for like getting the game if you've never played it before but um i mean if you've already played it i don't really see the point to replay it just for better graphics like it doesn't make any sense well in this case we're kind of reversing our types because at this point i'm saying well nintendo should take a step forward in the art department he's like well Majora's Mask was good the way it was so keep it that way so it goes to show you that not everyone is their type all the time So, as you can see, he was being very ISTJ, I was being very INTJ there. We were, shall we say, swapping letters. But, of course, like, when it comes to matters of faith, like, they've, like, I was on the INTJ uh, page on Facebook one time, and they accused me of being an ISTJ because because I was so firm in my beliefs there. 
Yeah, a couple of times I've gotten ISFJ because I, I'm not that typical chauvinist male that thinks like showing emotions is evil and like it's considered societally unacceptable to be weak every now and then. So just because the two of us are very strong in our Catholic beliefs doesn't make us any more or less a T. And it's not like it's a competition where it's like you got to be a T type or else, but it's more like thinking types rely on thinking types rely on a logical rational solution and it doesn't mean they don't have feelings but it just means we usually the key word is usually we usually don't allow them to influence our decision making so one perfect example of that is this upcoming mission trip and i'm having like so many dreaded thoughts about it and i'm just like freaking out about all the stuff that could go wrong but on the other hand i'm saying well i mean it's in the future so why worry about it besides you're going to have a good time and you're going to be an associate staff so that'll have these benefits so there's that j in me planning out like but that that what you just uh, said was um describing your inferior um um extrovert intuition because it's doom and gloom about the future yeah, we tend we tend to reverse our functions when we're stressed out. So, as you could see there, there was me like really, really putting extroverted intuition to the forefront. Now, when he is stressed out, he'll like, I'll be like, I'll be like, what the heck is happening? Like, please explain, people. I, I don't like where where like if somebody like we're at, we're at a new place or something in a tour and and like people are like walking too fast to be like, wait, stop! Where are we going? I don't understand. I can't say I've ever seen that in action, but it, that would probably be priceless to witness. But yeah, um, we, I, sorry, lost my train of thought there. IT types tend to, or sorry, I should say, INTJs and ISTJs, because they're secondary extroverted thinkers and not dominant extroverted thinkers it means that because normally dominant thinkers kind of lack a personal aspect to it like they tend to just tell the truth and not really have any kind of stopper on it so like they'll just be like this is the way it is follow it take it or leave it no worries and they're often the types that'll just like smash people's feelings and not even apologize for it whereas the two of us it's secondary and we also have tertiary introverted feeling so a lot of times I might say something like well forgive my rudeness but and then I'll start being blunt or he might say like well well Paul if it if it doesn't hurt your feelings I had some criticism about your book and then he'll just say it like he won't try to mince words he won't try to like sugarcoat what he has to say he'll just say Paul I hated that chapter and I and that's what makes him great because he helps me make my book a better book and i've done or there's, this in or there's sometimes there's something that's really good and he doesn't recognize it yeah because istjs put ourselves we put ourselves down so much like we're so harsh on ourselves we'll just be like oh my gosh that's so stupid and Andy'll be like what are you talking but, but there's something that like like he would have just kind of maybe glossed over and like i would think that like um there was one book he was writing where something was happening and i was like wait paul if you if you delay that until later, it'll increase the suspense, you know? Good way of looking at it. He sees the big picture. I'm just going at it piece by piece. So, yeah, th that's where we really help each other out, is we have that alternate perspective. And, and same thing with when I'm reading his book, I'll notice that certain details are off. Like, I'll say, well, Andy, maybe if you structured your sentence like this, that would help the story flow better. Or sometimes I'll just flat out say, your audience is going to be totally confused by that. And he'll be like, oh, maybe I should change it then. You get, you can tell that our types like constructive criticism, but one type of criticism we don't like is when our worth ethic is criticized or we're told that like our efforts are meaningless. So if I like spend so much time and effort, like say making a Mother's Day card for my mother or I like work myself to the like brink of my energy trying to save up enough money to really show someone that I care about them and they're just like work harder 
I'm like, give me a break, people. Like, you telling me I'm not good enough? And I, I think you could easily say the same thing, right? Yeah, I guess, yeah. I mean, a lot of times I won't show it, but, um, like, if I really put a lot of energy into a task and then people are just kind of, like, meh about it, then I'll be kind of hurt, you know? Because I put a lot of time into it, and, and I think it's, like, a really f cool thing, and then if, it, like, no one else thinks it's cool, it's, like, it's, like, yeah, I mean, where is everyone else, you know? Or it's, like, um... Or it's like I, I my fav one of my favorite um computer game series is is called Mist, and it has all these really cool like cool lines I like to quote, but I can never quote them because people won't get the reference, and it's sad, but at least I have my brother to, who knows about it. But other than that, it's like I'll say a cool thing and then people like won't get it. Yeah. So, usually, because he makes board games, and I think that his games are absolutely phenomenal. Like, the fact that he can make a board game just amazes me like nothing else. And so, usually, what ends up not hurting his feelings is when I present it like, like, Andy, this is amazing of a concept that you did, but I don't like playing games to begin with, so I'm not going to play this, but I'm not going to downplay your creativity. So in essence, I'm not criticizing the game. I'm just stating that I don't really like playing games to begin with. So even if he made the greatest game ever, it would take me a while to get used to it because it's something new. And then there's some times where I don't recognize my own strengths, where it's like um, someone will say like, oh, you're really good at this thing or, or, or oh, that was like, a, like, you're really funny, like the things you say sometimes. And I'll be like, oh, really? Is that true? Because I don't notice it. I don't notice really how I say things or anything mm, like that. Like, it's probably the like interior I don't, um, sensing there. Like, um, I have to ask people how to dress, like, if I want to look good, because because I don't really know, I don't really have a sense of style. So, um, Yeah, I've, I've often said that there's this hat he wears, and I always say, like, Andy, that's such a stupid hat. And, and, then, <laughs> and then a lot of, and then girls always compliment me on it. Yeah, so we'll just, we'll just... Uh, I'll just let that slide for now, because this video will get nowhere if we keep talking about that hat. But the last thing I want to cover, because this video is approaching 25 minutes, and I like to keep things at a nice round number, is we're both IJs. So that means both of us are naturally going to prefer, the keyword is prefer, structure, organization, um, like knowing ahead of time what the plan is before we do it. So, for instance, he was kind of apprehensive before making this video, so I told him the general outline of what we're going to be doing, and so he got the gist of it. Me, I'm a bit more free-flowing in these videos, but on the average day, I'm, like, so structure-oriented, it drives people crazy, because I have to plan out, like, the exact time and place, and even on my days off, I have to plan, like, when I'm going to be lazy. Like, yeah, I know, an ESTJ would cringe if they heard that, but I'm not an ESTJ. I enjoy having naps and stuff like that. I know an ESTJ that hates taking naps, because she's like, that. that's one less day of work. Yeah, well, I kind of have the same attitude. Like, I I hate taking naps unless they're necessary, because it's like I could be doing something else more productive or, or something else more fun, but I'm, I have to take a nap, and it's like, I roll, I... I'm, oh man, I'm wasted time. I have to take it, and then you get groggy and. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, when I, when I actually do have the energy to be awake, I usually like doing something productive. I don't like just doing mindless tasks that aren't going to mean anything. And then our, we're both introverts, and it may not seem like it because in this video we're, we kind of appear pretty outgoing, especially myself. But that's just because I'm a night owl and, him. I guess not so much, but but most introverts, they prefer a one-on-one -on -one setting, and they can be totally outgoing. Because remember that introversion doesn't necessarily mean that you're outgoing or shy. Because I know plenty of friends of mine that identify themselves as introverts, but they, they, um, they, they can talk your ear off. They can bore you to death with some of the stuff they talk about, but... They just don't like large crowds. They like to spend a lot of time alone after they've socialized, and they just start sort of wearing down the longer the conversation is prolonged. But one thing to keep in mind is that introverts are extroverts 
in their mind. That's right. The two of us, we like never shut down our brains. Like even when I'm sleeping, to get myself to sleep, I have to like literally start overthinking things. And then my brain is working so hard that it just gets tired. And yes, I know, you just pointed at the timer. <clears throat> yeah, I'll have to post a separate video talking about our mutual introversion. But suffice to say, just because we may appear outgoing and you're thinking, how the heck are you two introverts? Just observe us within a large group setting on the average day, because I know you certainly thought otherwise today. But, but when you mean I appear extroverted, like... I'm no, I'm talking thing. about myself. You thought I was such an extrovert at the coffee house. But th that was an odd day. We were also with each other. I mean, we've known each other for life, so we're comfortable with each other. Most introverts can be outgoing when they're comfortable with someone, but usually when I meet someone for the first time, I'm a little bit more reserved, not really willing to put myself out there. But around him, I can talk about pretty much anything. I can even get emotional around him. And I can, like, totally put him down. I can say, Andy, you're looking so stupid on the camera. He doesn't even care. And he could say, Paul, did you have to wear your hair down because you're going to look like a girl? And I'll be like, eh, whatever. People are weird. So I went a little bit over 25 minutes. The ISTJ in me is really mad at that. So thank you so much for watching my first collab video. And if you have any other requests for things that we could do, or should I interview other types that'd be great so thank you for watching and hope to see you again and as i always say keep the faith stay epic god bless any crazy catchphrases you want to say to the audience um well as they say in catholic answers be a saint what else is there amen good night guys